Now I'd like to introduce a physical situation that comes up often enough that it's worth taking some time to see how to properly model it. It also gives us the opportunity to appreciate the benefits of being flexible with our coordinate systems. And the situation is objects on inclines or slanted surfaces. Here's an example kind of problem. We have a block of mass m that's at rest on a plane that's got an angle of beta with the horizontal. Here we're just asking, what are all the forces acting on it? We know that since this is at rest, the net force has to be zero. It's mechanical equilibrium. So this is a statics problem or a Newton's first law problem. So our next step with any statics problem is to inventory the forces. And recall that our constraint is that there's no acceleration because it's a statics problem. So what forces do we have acting on this block? Well, first, we've got its weight acting down, which is going to be proportional to its mass. Then there's going to be two surface forces, two contact forces. These are the normal force, which is going to be perpendicular to the surface, and a frictional force. Now, in this case, the frictional force has to be acting uphill because it's preventing the block from sliding downhill, which gravity would try to make it do. We can model this by vertical and horizontal coordinates. I like to call them plumb coordinates. But it turns out that it's mathematically much simpler here to use inclined coordinates to change our coordinate system. In this case, we're going to have our coordinates being parallel and perpendicular not to the force of gravity, but parallel and perpendicular to the incline. The specific directions that you use are totally arbitrary. Here I'm going to make the positive x direction being uphill parallel to the surface, and the positive y direction being up perpendicular to the surface. The reason to do this is that now, in these coordinates, the normal force and the force of friction are parallel to one of the axes, and only the force of weight has components in both the x and y directions. If we use the plumb coordinates, we'd have to figure out x and y components of both the normal force and the friction force. If you're interested, I leave that as an exercise for you. Though, of course, if you come into office hours, we can talk about it. So let's look at the weight first. This is the most complex force in this coordinate system because we have to worry about both its x and y components. Here I've drawn the x and y directions so that we remember what they are. So our x component of the weight is going to be a bit downhill because the weight is pulling downhill. And we'll call that w sub x. And then the y component is going to be, again, downhill because the weight is down, but it's going to be perpendicular to the surface. Remember the direction that we had drawn the surface initially. I've drawn a dashed line to represent the horizontal direction. We've specified in the problem that the incline is at an angle beta to the horizontal. So I've drawn here that the angle between horizontal and the x component is going to be beta. The weight is perpendicular to the horizontal, so that's a 90 degree angle. Therefore, the angle that the x component of the weight makes to the weight itself is going to be 90 degrees minus beta. The weight, its x component, and its y component form a right triangle as well. We know that the internal angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees, so the two acute angles of the right triangle have to add up to 90 degrees, and the other angle, so the other angle of this right triangle must be beta again. We can use that to now find what the x and y components of weight are relative to the weight itself. The x is now the opposite side to this angle beta, and the y component is the adjacent side. So the x component is going to have a magnitude w sine beta. Here it's negative because, recall, the positive x direction is this way, and the x component is in the negative x direction. The y component is going to be the magnitude w times the cosine of the angle beta because it's the adjacent side. And again, this is negative. The y component of weight is in the opposite direction of the positive y axis. Now we can inventory all the forces. Here I'm going to make them in a nice table showing their x and y components. Next, the normal force. The normal force must have a component of zero in the x direction because the normal force is entirely directed in the y direction. Since the y component of the net force has to be zero, then the normal force, being a force of constraint, just has to be whatever it takes to make that so. The y component of the normal force, which is the normal force itself, has to be opposite the y component of the weight. So that's just mg cosine beta, positive because the normal force is pushing in the up direction. Then the friction, being another force of constraint here, it just has to be whatever it needs to be to keep the block from sliding downhill. So then it's going to be opposite the x component of the weight, which makes it positive mg sine beta.
Here's a related problem, a little more complex. This one, instead of being a statics problem, a Newton's first law problem, is a dynamics problem, a Newton's second law problem. So now we're saying that this block is moving. Right now it's sliding uphill, so obviously something had to have given it a push. It's going to be slowing down. Eventually it will stop, and either it will stick if the static force, if this, and either it will stick if the static friction is great enough, or it'll start to slide back down if the static friction isn't enough to keep it from sliding. We're asking first, what's the net force, and then what's its acceleration? Now to specify our forces, we're going to use the same coordinates that we used last time, the inclined coordinates, because they're just so darn convenient. And they're going to be doubly convenient here because of the constraint we have on our system, which is that there's no acceleration perpendicular to the plane. There can be acceleration parallel to the plane. This kind of a situation is ideally suited for our inclined coordinates, because we can say that the y component of the net force is zero, and the x component of the net force is what we're trying to find. Our individual forces are the same forces as before, the weight, which is downward, the normal force, which is upward, out of the plane. Our friction force is still parallel to the surface, but now it's acting downhill, and the reason for that is because the box is sliding uphill. If the box were sliding downhill, then the friction force would be uphill. So let's make our inventory table of the forces, listing their x and y components. First, the net force, our force of constraint, all that we know for sure about this is that the y component is zero. The x component we expect not to be zero, so we can't fill that in yet. We know what the weight is. That's exactly the same as before. Gravity hasn't changed, so we can use the same figuring that we did before to show that the x component of weight is minus mg sine beta, and the y component of weight is minus mg cosine beta, where beta is the angle of the incline. Next, because of our constraint, we can easily figure out what the normal force has to be. The normal force is just whatever is necessary to keep the y component of the net force zero. So that means that it must be the opposite of the y component of weight, or positive mg cosine beta. The friction is only in the parallel direction, only in the x direction, so we know right away that that's zero in the y direction. We were banking on that already when we calculated what the normal force has to be. Now we just get to figure out what the friction actually is. It's no longer a force of constraint, so we can't just negate the x component of the weight. However, we can use our formula for kinetic friction, which is just to say that it's mu, some coefficient of friction mu, between the block and the surface, times the normal force. The normal force is mg cosine beta, so this minus mu times n is going to be minus mu times mg cosine beta. The x component of the net force is just going to be the sum of the x components of the forces that are acting on the block. That's minus mg sine beta plus zero minus mu mg cosine beta. There's a common factor in here of minus mg, so we can write this compactly as minus mg times the sum of sine beta plus mu cosine beta. Now to finish the problem, we need to find the acceleration. We know that the magnitude of the net force is mg times the sum of sine beta plus mu cosine beta. We also know that the acceleration is directly proportional to the net force. It's the net force divided by the mass. So in this case, we just divide this formula by m, and we get minus g times sine beta plus mu cosine beta. Just a quick check that this actually makes sense. It does. First of all, the sine beta plus mu cosine beta is unitless. Those are all just pure numbers. And the g is in units of acceleration, so that's good. In terms of what it's telling us, the sine beta increases as the surface becomes more tilted, which tells us that the weight is pulling down on it more. The mu cosine beta part gets larger as the surface becomes more flat, because then there's a greater normal force and there's greater friction. So the friction decreases as the slope becomes more tilted, and the weight has a bigger effect as the surface becomes more tilted. Both of these make perfect sense. The magnitude of the acceleration is going to be g times the sum sine beta plus mu cosine beta. The direction is parallel to the surface in the downhill direction, so we call that the minus x direction. There, we have completely specified all the forces acting on the block that's sliding on the surface. We've specified what the net force is, and we've figured out what the acceleration is, both its magnitude and its direction.